So we've talked about how meiosis is critical because it, it sets this kind of stage for um, sexual recombination, which is so critical in our evolutionary history with this relationship that we have with microbes. But sometimes problems arise during meiosis. <clears throat> One of those problems is called non-disjunction. This occurs when chromosomal strands don't separate. So of course, meiosis is started with the process of DNA replication, and then the cell cleaves into you know, two daughter cells, each of which has two homologous chromosomes. Um, when there's non-disjunction in this process, though, one daughter cell ends up, or, or in the second division where you end up with only one chromosome, one daughter cell ends up with two copies of the chromosome while the other has no copies. And so <clears throat> in developing zygotes, this can be problematic because if a gamete contains um, two copies of a chromosome, this results in what's called a trisomy um, in the developing zygote. This is where the cells have three copies of a particular chromosome rather than two. And so the most common explanation of this um, is, or the most common occurrence of this is um, with uh, what we call trisomy 21, um, which is also known as Down syndrome. And so we are used to um, talking about situations where um, developing uh, fetuses have three copies of chromosome number 21. One of the other trisomies that we test for is um, one of the other trisomies that we test for uh, is trisomy 18, um, which causes other kind of global um, problems with development. So these are things that can be tested for pretty uh, early in development. Um, one of the tests that they do is uh, called um, the nuchal fold screening, which is an early ultrasound where uh, they measure kind of the thickness of the fold of the neck, uh, and that can be indicative of <clears throat> of um, of uh, at least uh, Down syndrome. One of the other tests that they can run is an AFP blood test um, on the maternal blood looking for markers from fetuses that have uh, have trisomies, um, and this can highlight both um, um, trisomy 21 and trisomy 18. If these come back as indicative of a higher risk uh, for the developing fetus having one of these trisomies, then they are able to uh, go forward with an amniocentesis um, or some other measure by which they're testing the fetal genome. So trisomy 21 uh, occurs in a, roughly one out of every 1,000 births. It's one of the most common genetic anomalies that um, that parents can face and, and thus is what is widely tested for. Uh, there are there are health problems that come with um, these trisomies. And so specifically for trisomy 21, this includes an increased susceptibility to respiratory infections, an increased occurrence of leukemia, um, and some cardiac problems, heart problems that um, sometimes lead to younger age death. Now, of course, we recognize that um, uh, things like trisomy 21 exist um, across the spectrum that there can be very mild cases where there's just a slight um, uh, decline in mental faculties um, and overall otherwise uh, fairly good health and um, that these individuals have uh, the capacity to care for themselves but there are other more severe cases that are either not compatible with life um, or lead to uh, lead to earlier death um, and so generally, babies born with trisomy 21 are going to need a, additional assistance throughout their lives, whether it's assisted living context, whether it's educational assistance, um, that sort of thing, or whether it's it's um, treatment for other health impairments because of the severity of the uh, trisomy. Um, when we've got non-disjunction in sex cells, this can lead to sterility, mental impairments, problems with growth and development. So there are two that are, I guess, a bit more more common than others, and they are two of the conditions that are often referred to as intersex conditions. One of them is Klinefelter syndrome. This is where a male has two copies of an X um, and a Y, and Klinefelter's males are generally uh, sterile or <clears throat> or kind of approaching sterile um, and have problems, particularly at puberty, when they would undergo the um, secondary sex characteristic development. Um, they need to be treated with growth hormone. Um, they need to be treated with testosterone. Um, Kleinfelter's boys can also have what's called a micropenis, uh, which is where the penis is smaller in size because of the extra production of estrogen <clears throat> due to the extra copy of the X.
Um, the kind of the flip of Kleinfelters are girls who are classified as Turner syndrome. This is where they have one X um, and no second sex chromosome. And so these girls are very diminutive in stature. Um, they're going to be very small and, and petite, uh, very thin frame. They often have very long fingers. Um, and these girls have problems with growth and development as well as uh, being uh, infertile. And so they have to be treated with both growth hormone and um, supplementary estrogen later in life if they're going to develop the suite of female secondary sex characteristics like breasts and uh, the gynoid pattern of fat that gives us our hourglass figure. So, <clears throat> um, so there are, are certainly problems that arise um, kind of globally in a developing zygote if there's non-disjunction with either um, autosomal cells or with their sex cells. <clears throat> All right, so lastly, we're going to look at some of the new frontiers that have come uh, since about the 1980s. And um, some of these have very prominent roles to play in um, evolutionary anthropology. The first of these was the development of the polymerase chain reaction in 1986. What this allowed uh, researchers to do was make thousands of copies of small strands of DNA from a relatively small DNA sample. And then you can take these copies of DNA um, and subject them to analyses without destroying the original sample. Um, this plays a really important role in forensic anthropology. Um, we have, and it's mentioned in the optional video for this week, um, there's something called DNA fingerprinting, where we have patterns of repeated DNA sequences that are unique to particular individuals unless they uh, have an identical twin. And so um, PCR allows for the amplification of what may be small DNA samples from a few drops of blood or um, semen or <clears throat> some hair or something um, into a larger usable sample by which identity can be determined. And so this can help identify victims um, if there's if the body's been burned but not burned completely. Um, sometimes you don't have the dental records or the fingerprints to find out who the victim was. You can utilize PCR to uh, get a DNA fingerprint. Um, you can also identify perpetrators that way if there's uh, the blood of a perpetrator, the semen <clears throat> of, um, of a rapist or, or something along those lines. We can kind of amplify or magnify those um, signals. Um, now, you know, being able to detect or identify um, identity is going to uh, rely on either having DNA from that individual already on file, which happens more often with perpetrators than it necessarily does with victims, or having um, the DNA of people who are very closely related to that uh, individual who you're trying to identify. Of course, if you don't know who the victim is, you can't really have DNA on file of close relatives um, because how do you know who to approach to get those samples? Uh, recombinant DNA technology allows for the transfer of genes from one species to another. Um, this has played a prominent role in biomedicine. Uh, for example, we've been able to insert human genes into bacterial cells and then uh, engineered those bacterial cultures to produce things like insulin. Um, this has made insulin much more readily available and less expensive for uh, people with diabetes because we don't have to <clears throat> rely on uh, the pancreas of other higher taxa like, you know, um, bovine pancreas uh, to produce the insulin that we then need to harvest. You know, we're not having to kill organisms to be able to harvest insulin when we can just engineer bacteria to do it. Um, this is also, the recombinant DNA technology is also going to be, it's going to tie into kind of resurrecting extinct species, um, which we can talk about in a moment. Uh, we've had cases of, uh, uh, ties into this cloning as well. Uh, cloning, um, we have been on a quest kind of over the last 20, 30 years to clone more and more species. Cloning plants is relatively easy. Sometimes you just need a cutting of the root or, or <clears throat> a cutting of a leaf that you can then um, treat with a hormone that stimulates root growth. Um, much more difficult to do with animals. We've successfully cloned sheep, rats, monkeys, frogs, and others. Uh, scientists in China have claimed that they've cloned humans, um, though this has not been subjected to the scrutiny of the international um, international teams of scientists. So we can't really comment on the veracity of that. But one of the things that has become noticeable uh, is that many of the cloned organisms or individuals, um, they're 
less resilient. Um, they senesce at faster ages. Like Dolly the sheep started showing signs of old age as young as six when sheep normally wouldn't have that kind of uh, senescence until they were nine or ten years of age. And so um, this brings into question maybe <clears throat> the source of the cells that we're trying to clone. If we're trying to clone autosomal cells of fully adult humans, um, we may run into a problem whereby those cells have already aged and there's been an age-related decline in this process of, uh, of DNA replication or the DNA has been somehow damaged and so this may lead to <coughs> um, this may lead to lower kind of uh, of virility lower kind of, of uh, health of the cloned individuals you know, using stem cells might be the answer to this um, but that also then requires having a supply of stem cells that um, that one is able to kind of harvest the DNA from to be able to clone it. Um, it may be used to resurrect extinct species like woolly mammoths. The first, there are two species in paleoanthropology that we're trying to bring back. One of those is the auroch. It was a highland Scottish cow from about 8,000 years, six to 8,000 years ago. Stood about eight to nine feet at the shoulder and was a critical part of maintaining that highland ecosystem. Um, we are trying to resurrect the auroch through what's called backbreeding, where, you know, when we domesticate species, we take the smaller individuals and, and only allow those to reproduce. With backbreeding, we're taking the largest uh, individuals of domesticated breeds and allowing those to breed, hopefully going back towards that larger size of that native auroch. Um, the other one is woolly mammoths. <clears throat> um, we, uh, you know, as, as we've had global climate change, there have been permanently frozen areas of the Arctic that have thawed that have given us nearly uh, perfectly preserved woolly mammoth specimens. And so one of the ventures is to uh, take the DNA out of a cell of the woolly mammoth, take an elephant egg and denucleate it, insert the DNA of the woolly mammoth, and then allow that egg to implant in the uterus of the elephant, thereby that elephant will give birth to a woolly mammoth. Now, you know, we run into an ethical dilemma here. Um, in science, just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should do something. And in a situation like the decline of the Arctic environments due to global climate change, you know, it's probably not ethically sound for us to try to bring back a woolly mammoth just to say that we can. It may be useful, though, for the resurrection of of um, some more recently extinct species like maybe the passenger pigeon um, or uh, the, the giant auk or the great auk. Um, it could also play a role in potentially introducing some genetic diversity into some critically endangered populations. So there are species like cheetahs that are incredibly inbred and have very little uh, genetic diversity and thusly are prone to <clears throat> outbreaks of disease um, or even targeted you know, attacks um, on their genome. So um, if we were to find um, you know, stored specimens, hundreds of year old specimens in natural history museums of, um, of cheetahs that uh, retain some of that earlier genetic diversity, we may be able to use these recombinant DNA technologies or cloning techniques to I'll reintroduce some of that diversity back into extremely endangered species genomes. And so that may play a role in conservation. Um, it may play a role in maintaining larger metapopulations as well as we increasingly fragment forest habitats. You know, we may play, we, instead of just having to move animals from population to population to maintain that genetic diversity, we may be able to do it artificially through some of these <coughs> um, new applications in genomics. The Human Genome Project is another. Um, this uh, was funded in the 1990s. It's also referred to. It's also referred to in uh, the optional video this week. And the goal was to sequence the three million bases that yield roughly 25,000 protein coding genes in humans. We've also sequenced mice, chimpanzees, western lowland gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, and rhesus macaques. In 2010, we finished sequencing the Neanderthal genome, which has been useful in biological anthropology to <coughs> help determine um, how much we share genetically with Neanderthals. Uh, you know, Neanderthals went extinct about 45,000 years ago, um, but we found through uh, sequencing the Neanderthal genome that modern Europeans and Asian populations have anywhere from 1 to 4% Neanderthal genes, while African populations do not. So um, we've also found that the populations that have the highest proportion of Neanderthal genes, 
are Native Americans pushing that 4%, uh, whereas Western Europeans are closer to 1%. So we can determine who in the world is more Neanderthal. Um, all of this helps to pinpoint <clears throat> maybe whether we should consider Neanderthal as a separate species versus a separate subspecies, and when, if any, and uh, we interbred with them in the past. And some of the more recent um, research has also looked at um, microsatellite DNA and has pinpointed um, an interbreeding event in the Middle East around 60,000 years ago and an interbreeding event in uh, Western Asia around 45,000 years ago. <laughs> um, additionally, um, there was a headline a couple years ago, and your textbook doesn't mention this, but uh, that stated that uh, Melanesians contained alien DNA, that their genome contained alien DNA. Now, this doesn't mean extraterrestrial as in from another planet, um, but uh, they were able to identify DNA sequences that they haven't found in any living or known kind of uh, extinct population. Um, further analyses with uh, some sister finds of Neanderthals, Denisovans, have shown that this quote-unquote alien DNA is Denisovan DNA. And so as Neanderthals and Denisovans moved out of the Middle East, Neanderthals generally went north and west, Denisovans generally went south and east. Um, eventually, uh, settling in areas like like uh, Micronesia. So like Papua New Guineans have a higher proportion of Denisovan DNA and there are incidences then of interbreeding between modern human populations and Denisovans probably on about the same time scale that 60 to 45,000 um, years ago uh, that we see for Neanderthals as well. The Human Genome Project has also allowed us to track um, population movements and examine how different environments favor different phenotypes. And so one application of this has been uh, with modern African Americans. Um, there were certain ethnicities that were more heavily drawn from in the slave trade um, that were subjugated by <clears throat> other African populations living in those regions. And so um, through through the use of the Human Genome Project, we're able to identify people's ethnic heritage, which can um, kind of give one perhaps a more complete sense of identity. Um, with respect to looking at how environments favor different phenotypes, uh, we see things like uh, uh, this interaction between latitude and thusly um, temperature and oxygen concentration and UV radiation um, on overall stature. So we can compare the Inuit to the Maasai, for example, to see um, particularly what, what genes are implicated in different um, average adult heights. The Inuit have an average adult male height of about five foot four. The um, Maasai about six foot four. And so we can track kind of how the uh, environment shapes um, mutation in genes and, and differential expression of certain genes. Lastly, we've seen the production of functional synthetic bacteria genomes, where uh, essentially we're creating new forms of life. Um, it's not actually creating life out of nothing because we take existing bacteria and take the DNA out of them and then um, enter or insert this new synthetic genome. Um, but it effectively alters the DNA expression to those of a different species and allows us to create these laboratory colonies of entirely new artificial species. Uh, and so this could play a role, um, and, and does play a role, I mean, this kind of, this coupled with recombinant DNA uh, techniques um, plays a role in, um, in genetically modifying foods, like that uh, botulinum toxin resistance that we can breed into tomatoes. Um, but it also um, potentially opens up the door for bioterrorism. So another area where we're kind of ethically gray, let's say, um, because, effectively um, entirely new pathogens could be um, created from um, laboratory induced kind of DNA changes in existing pathogens that can make them more virulent, um, that can um, allow for a different mode of transmission. Could you imagine if something like uh, HIV were aerosol transmitted um, or can also um, innovate resistance to all available medical treatments so that um, we might have strains that um, effectively are resistant to antibiotics and, and thusly any form of treatment that we have. So, um, you know, as we celebrate all of the genetic advances or the advances in genomics, we also need to um, kind of cautiously move forward and 
um, really critically examine the role that ethics plays in um, research in genomics. And so in summary, recognize that cells are the fundamental units of life and um, the different kinds of cells, somatic and reproductive. Uh, understand that genetic information is contained in DNA, be able to work through the process of DNA replication and the resulting protein synthesis, so talking about transcription and translation. Uh, be able to identify the role of regulatory genes, um, both you know across species and within humans with this pattern of embryonic development, uh, the role of coding versus non-coding DNA and introns and exons, and how some genes may code for a couple of different proteins, and thusly some sequences of DNA may be introns in one um, pathway but exons in another. Uh, be able to recognize differences between mitosis and meiosis, um, this critical role that meiosis has played in introducing diversity with uh, sexual recombination, um, as well as some of the problems that may come with imperfect uh, replication. And then lastly, and I forgot this bullet point, be able to and talk about some of these uh, advances that have been made in genomics and specifically how those might apply in the field of evolutionary anthropology.